I like how your dog is perfectly framed, <laughs> like behind you. I he's hope down. he's not. <laughs> I hope he's not too. Uh, he's been kind of wound up for the last ten minutes or so. Mm. For the last eight months. For the last three year, three and a half years. We'll give it another couple minutes here. <clears throat> See if BPD joins us and then we'll get rolling. Oh, there's people just called in. Kinsey, are you still on the East Coast? Yes, I am. So I'm probably going to leave at 11 or 8 p.m. your time. Just FYI. No problem. Broadcasting <laughs> YouTube. Hmm. <clears throat> All right. Well, in the interest of time, even though we don't have too much on the agenda tonight, but don't want to, uh, want to be respectful of everyone's evening, we'll go ahead and get started. And then if uh, BPD joins us, then they can chime in when they do. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, the January meeting of the Central Beaverton Neighborhood Association Committee. Um, my name's Tom Drain. Uh, I'm the chair tonight. And what I'll probably do is uh, start off by going around and uh, I'll call on you. And if you could just um, uh, speak up and introduce yourself and tell us what brings you uh, to the meeting tonight and um, have the office, uh, all the board members, you know, uh, introduce themselves as well, then we will uh, get started. So once again, me, Tom Drain, chair, I kind of have to be here. Um, and uh, from there, we'll go to uh, John Duggar. Hey everyone, John Duggar. I also have to be here because I'm vice chair. <laughs> and Quinn? Yeah, uh, Quinn uh, on the board and Trigger. Fantastic. Uh, Amanda? Um, I'm the recorder for the Central Beaverton NAC and also the community engagement manager for Beaverton Civic Theater. Fantastic. Kevin? Hey, I'm Kevin. I'm the executive director of the Down Beaverton Downtown Association, downtown resident and a member of this board. Kinsey? Hi, I'm Kinsey and I am a resident of downtown Beaverton and I'm a member of the board. Lovely. Uh, Lulu? Hey everyone, Lulu Ballesteros. I'm part of the communications department in THPRD. Miles? Miles Glowacki, I'm the Neighborhood and Public Involvement Coordinator for the city. Uh, Mr. Gerber? Uh, Steven Gerber, I'm working with Car Auto Group on their uh, car Subaru improvements. Excellent. And then uh, what I'm going to try and do here, if I can do this correctly, is uh, it's going to give our uh, participants a uh, voice privileges and have them introduce themselves as well. I don't know if I, my co-host, Miles, there we go. Uh, so uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, uh, kind of one by one, uh, Mr. Nichols. Hey, good evening, Dick Nichols, long time Beaverton area resident, not particularly downtown, but uh, I guess you'd say I was a curiosity seeker. Fantastic, uh, well, welcome back. Uh, Fran Miller. Uh, 
Can you hear us, Brian? If you are on, well, let's see, I guess they wouldn't be, they would have a phone number if they were on the phone. Uh, well, that's all right. Everybody has the right to also. But if you're having uh, any uh, difficulty in uh, speaking, you can always use the chat function if that's available to you um, to uh, let us know if you have questions uh, or uh, anything like that, technical or otherwise. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Uh, but we'll go ahead and move on. Oh, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> there's always extra steps. I always forget how to do that. But I'm, I'm Fran Miller. I was on the board some years ago and I've attended the last couple of meetings of y'all. Absolutely. Y yes, fantastic. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Phillip. Hi, yeah, I'm Rachel. Um, I live in central Beaverton. Um, I'm here to hear about what's going on in the neighborhood. Fantastic. And Thane Miller, if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Thane Howard. Thane. Thane, uh, Thane Howard, pardon me. Thane Howard, yeah. Uh, I've lived in central Beaverton for about 34 years. Oh, is that all? Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to everyone. And then the last person here, and we'll just go ahead and roll into in, is uh, Officer Sutton from Beaverton Police Department. So, uh, Officer Sutton, can you uh, can you hear us and can we hear you this week? I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm using a phone this time, a little different than a computer, so thank you. Absolutely. No problem. Thank you. Everyone again. Uh, nothing too earth-shattering to bring up on the police side. Uh, standard standard calls for service have been occurring. The crime stats that I was able to pull, unfortunately, are for the month of November. I couldn't get December. They're just not up yet. And for the same stuff I bring up a lot. Theft is always, property crime in general, but specifically theft is always at a higher tick this time of year. Uh, the package thieves were in full force this holiday season, unfortunately. Something else that I noticed uh, throughout my patrol shifts that there was definitely increase of our calls related to mental health and calls related to domestic violence. I don't know if that's COVID related, weather related, stress, probably a little bit of everything, but those are very concerning, of course, domestic violence being very serious. So uh, I'm just going to throw it out there. If anyone knows anybody that needs assistance with resources, I work closely with Washington County Mental Health. They are fantastic. I also work with the Domestic Violence Resource Center located in Beaverton as well. So there's assistance out there. You don't necessarily need to go through the police to utilize these resources, but if somebody is interested, I can always point you in the right direction. Uh, the only other tidbit of news coming down the pipe about the department is we are slated in the next month or so as officers to get the COVID vaccine. I don't know the exact date yet, but it is coming. It's been talked about already. So that's something that we're all gonna be getting soon. Thank goodness we all wanna get back to normal. So we are looking forward to that. Does anybody have any questions or anything concerning or any specific things they've seen up there that they want to know further about and might be able to help? Uh, I have a quick question, um, yes. kind of a repeat of, of we've talked before. I was wondering if, if uh, uh, you could maybe put in a request for one of the photo things or the radar things on Main uh, yes. Avenue again. We've, I've noticed the last couple weeks there's been really like like one car was probably going 50 or 60. Like yeah. it was, and just speeding down like like crazy fast. Um, in general, I have noticed a decrease, but man, the ones that are going are, are getting faster and uh, I just haven't seen the, the radar thing out as much, so. John, do you remember where that van parked before? Was it Maine at about 10th or was it closer to 5th? 10th, uh, yeah, okay. no, and that's that's great because that kind of there's some trees there that it's not officially hidden, but it just kind of blends in a little more. And then people, you see a lot of brake lights then, and I like you know scare people a little bit. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely, and I believe you 100%. I recall going out there and doing speed enforcement myself. Yeah. People in the 30 and 40s, lots of them. So, and that's yeah. 25. It is way too fast. I agree. Yeah, especially, I mean, we, we, we have a bunch of kids in the neighborhood. We walk dogs all the time. I see uh, right behind us is the, the uh, retirement community with a lot of walkers, too. And, you know, sometimes when you're crossing the street and you look down and you see a car, if they're going in normal, normal space, you have plenty of time to cross. But if they're going 50 or 60, they can be right on top of you. And it's, it's pretty scary. So yeah. I appreciate your help with that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I agree with you. Way too fast for that neighborhood completely. I'll, uh, I'll make an 
email to the traffic sergeant. So uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. But I think the last time I made the request, it took at least a couple of weeks to get them out there. So uh, I'll see what I can do here. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, that was good. Anything else from anybody? Uh, yeah, just real quick, kind of in the same vein. Um, I know that I've seen around and there's been um, some decrease in some of the just random street racing that has been going around. I know it's happened on Shoals and Hall and Murray and mm -hmm. Farmington. And, and so I know it's it's not, uh, doesn't seem to be as organized and, and centralized as some of the stuff that was happening in Multnomah County. Um, and hence, I think that makes your jobs harder since they're crossing jurisdictions and they're not persistent. Is there any kind of coordination with like Washington County sheriffs or Tigard police for uh, response or or anything or is or is there any talk in the just in, inside the department as as to uh, how this is being handled or if it's even kind of high on the radar it's it's low on the radar I'm going to say we don't get a whole lot of organized street racing every now and then and I don't know who organized these by the way but every now and then these car clubs will show up at random places in Washington County most recently it was Sunset Transit Center I don't know why or how they picked that place but that was just the other day Another spot, they've gone to uh, places in kind of South Beaverton, those business parks like Cascade or Nimbus on weekends when nobody's around and these huge parking lots are empty. Uh, they must be organized on social media, but every now and then these car club groups pop up and we'll get about 500 people just show up at one spot at one time. Um, they mostly just hang out. They're pretty docile. I haven't seen any specific problems related to it, but it does happen occasionally, not the level that Portland has though. Thank goodness. As far as enforcement goes, I know of nothing specific where these groups are being tracked, monitored, or, or anything like that. Uh, it sure. could be about it. Yeah, I didn't even know. Even know sometimes there are. Uh, I didn't know if there was any sort of department-wide policies about um, engagement. I know it can be unsafe to engage in to, to further exacerbate that kind of behavior because it leads to even less safe driving, which endangers even more uh -huh. people. Ironically, um, so it just wasn't. I kind of wasn't sure what the, the department's it's we're gonna there even was one was. Yeah, there kind of is. So if we attempt to make a traffic stop on vehicles that are speed racing, which is a, it's a listed violation in the Oregon by statute mm -hmm. under a violation of speed or speed racing, um, we would treat it like a traffic stop. If the driver of one of these vehicles racing uh, fails to yield and it turns into an elude, we're not going to chase. We're, we're going to let them go. And that's for safety reasons. We only uh, pursue vehicles in specific situations. Great. Well, that's, that's good to know. And it's also now you know, being able to, if there are other residents that ask us or we're other members here about, like, oh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people racing. What's Beaverton Police doing about this? Then, mm -hmm. then we, can, we can help, you know, let them know that if they're, if they're not being pursued, then it's, even if a cop sees them, then it's for, for, a valid public safety reason. So it's just totally understandable, so. Yeah, and just to clarify, a pursuit's gonna be if we initiate a traffic stop with a violator and mm -hmm. they fail to build or actively uh, take steps to elude being stopped mm -hmm. or captured, that's that's something we don't push the issue on unless it meets some specific criteria. Sure. I mean, the risk of public safety is, is so high that we need to catch this person. Right, excellent. Uh, does any, anyone else have questions for Officer Sutton. Just a quick related comment to everyone here, just a, a reminder to you on the, uh, on the vein of uh, increased uh, package theft. Um, if you have a doorbell camera, um, oftentimes, uh, well, it would happen with us. We had um, the thief notice the camera after they took the package and uh, tried to damage the camera. And most, uh, um, kind of mainstream camera uh, manufacturers offer a, uh, a free return um, or a, a free what, replacement um, if there is any form of damage to your camera from um, from someone. So just a uh, kind of reminder for those that, uh, that don't know. All right, good to know. Fantastic, thank you, Officer Sutton, and we'll see you next month. All right everybody take care fantastic thanks for that all right and now to uh lulu for the thprd report hi everyone um not huge highlights to to share uh as you may have seen mo well, all of our centers are still closed we're still waiting for for 
news on that. But one thing that we are opening, I don't have a date, but you will see it opening soon, is our open pool uh, rally. That's gonna be opening up soon. That was a big question that the community was asking. Uh, another thing that you will see happening is events. Uh, for example, drive through uh, bingo, uh, the kind of activities where people can either gather or connect virtually or in person while following socially distance uh, rules, et cetera. So you, you'll see things pop up uh, in the events side. Again, the best way to be informed about anything that's going on in parks and rec, nature and trails would be to subscribe to the newsletter or just look at the website and keep an eye on what's coming. Um, the other thing that we have is winter registration. We have online classes going on. They start this month and it's our winter program, all of it virtual. There's things like ukulele, uh, dance classes, fitness. Uh, talking about fitness, we will have a winter edition of Fitness in the Park uh, starting in January 11th. So people can safely gather uh, socially distance in parks and do either Tai Chi, Zumba, and that kind of class. And again, it's free. The other thing that I wanted to share is a little bit of feedback uh, on a question that somebody had last time about what's going on to a piece of land that we purchased next to Schiffler Park. Mm -hmm. We were all curious about that. So I asked Design and Development. They don't have anything specific that they're, that they're going to do with that property, but it was an opportunity that came up. It was being sold, it's close to Schiffler. So the, the district just went ahead and purchased it. Uh, and we'll keep an eye on it and let's see what design and development uh, shares in the future. And I'm here if you all have any questions and happy to be here as always. Great, thank you, Lulu. Thank you for that update about the, the parcel adjacent to Schiffler Park. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone have questions or comments for Lou? Oh, John, of course. Uh, uh, Fan Oak, or sorry, Greenway Park this past weekend was, uh, I mean, we had a lot of rain, but it's, it's every time it rains a little bit, it floods really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there was a capital improvement, something going on there. Can you, can you kind of let us know what's going on or give us an update? Or uh, I know they did the park between Denny and Hall is largely, from what I understand, it's complete now, but what about the section between Hall and Shoals Ferry, which was almost unusable this past weekend? It was yes. flooded everywhere. They've been, I can bring more information on the next, uh, on our next meeting, but as far as I know, they've been, they did an open house to ask the community what they were looking for. There's many ideas out there from either bringing, uh, making the, the part where you have to walk, making it higher, to creating a passage uh, that would go through uh, Schultz Ferry that's coming, mm -hmm. but there's other ideas because it doesn't only happen in one area of Greenway. Mm -hmm. So there are improvements coming. Uh, there, if you go to the website and I'll send it to us in the chat uh, oh. where they had the open house, there's a bunch of really good information there of why in my head people are saying, get rid of the, the beavers or don't get rid of them or make the, the floor higher. What about a bridge? So there's many ideas and they kind of explain there why one or the other would be the best solution, but they're asking the community for their feedback on the decisions that they're making. So I'll add it to, to the chat. And awesome. bring Thank more. Thanks so questions. much. Great. Uh, are there other questions or comments for THPRD? All right. Well, thank you so much, Lulu, and we will see you next month. See you next month. Thank you all. Have a good night. Uh, once again, our BCCI rep uh, is not in, uh, is not able to attend. Uh, the only information that he passed along to me was that uh, all that they did at this most recent meeting was elect officers um, for the uh, for the current. So uh, apparently, there was nothing new to report. Regardless, so we will see Jonathan in February, hopefully. And I believe that brings us now to. City update with awfully shaggy Francisca Rose. I gave Francisca the night off. She was traveling today. Um, she was going to come though. She's a trooper. Absolutely. So lots of 
big changes at City Hall. I'm sure you're all aware, but I will uh, give you the rundown. We, um, the changes to the Beaver Beaverton City Council. So we have new and reelected councilors joining um, some of the other positions. And Mayor Lacey Beatty begins her first term as mayor after serving on the council since 2015. Before serving as an elected official, she volunteered on the city's visioning advisory committee and on local boards. Her vacated city council position will be filled at the council's direction. So they haven't made a decision yet on how they're gonna do that, um, as far as I know. Councilor Nadia Hassan and Councilor Allison Tivion join us as new council members, filling an established seat um, and an expanded position as part of the new city charter. Um, council Councillor Hassan is the first to hold city council position six and previously served on the Twalton Hills Park and Recreation Visioning Task Force and a board member of the Islamic Society of Greater Portland. Councillor Tivion, Tivion previously served as the Beaverton Arts Commission Chair and the State of Oregon Complete Counts Committee Co-Chair. And Councillor Mark Fagan, Councillor Laura Mitchell and Councillor Mark Sansusi rejoined the council as reelected and existing council members. Uh, Councillor Fagan has been on the council since 2013. He was founding chairperson of the Visioning Advisory Committee, and he was elected to his third and final term in November. Uh, Laura Mitchell was elected in 2018, and Mark Sansusi joined the council in, council in 2008. Um, he was a planning commissioner and on BCCI before that. The mayor and city councilors will be sworn in tomorrow night um, at the council meeting. We've announced our interim city manager. Uh, his name is Mr. Kurt Wilson. Um, it's a milestone in the implementation of our new charter and the new charter became operational January 1st. It's, he's gonna help us um, transition to a council manager form of government and support hiring of a long-term city manager. Mr. Um, Wilson has 30 years of experience with local government. He's been both an elected official and hired positions. Um, he's been a city councilor um, and then um, worked a variety of other positions in, in city halls. Uh, most recently, he was the city manager of the city of Stockton in California. Um, our long-term city manager recruitment is expected to begin in spring and will include opportunities for further staff and community engagement. If you have questions about the new city charter, um, there's an FAQ and news about it at the Beaverton website, uh, beavertonoregon.gov slash charter. And that is all my announcements. Nice. Uh, any questions or comments for our city representative? Fire away, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Miles. Yeah. I am. I'm uh, very excited about the the new city manager. Um, I have two questions about it. I'll ask them both at the same time because they're both pretty simple. Uh, the first is, did he say if he has an interest in being the permanent city manager? And then the second question is, do you know if he is planning on doing any visits to the NACs around Beaverton to connect with residents? Um, I believe what he said about applying for the permanent or the, the long-term city manager position is that he's open to it. Um, but right now he is focused on transitioning the city. Um, I don't believe he's gonna be going out to the NACs. Um, his primary role is gonna really be for the next six months is really working with city council and establishing um, how the city and city council and the mayor and everything operates now. Um, so I don't believe so. Cool, that's understandable. I, you know, when we get a, a long-term city manager, I'd encourage the next to extend an invitation to them to come visit. Cool, yeah, thanks Miles. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, anything else for Miles? Great. Uh, in that case, we will do our officers' reports, starting with approval of the minutes. Uh, I assume 
everyone else got uh, minutes and I think they were, were there amended minutes? Yes, they were, they were resubmitted <laughs> to Francisca. Excellent, fantastic. Yeah, I did notice one change that needs to be made and I think it wasn't a mistake you made, Amanda. I think it was, I, I think I gave the wrong number on the number of masks. So instead of 700, we are at 1300 that we've given away, which is good. That's good quite mistake. a big difference. Yeah, that's a yeah, good yeah. mistake. Okay. Um, so, so. Um, yeah, and we actually, I just got another 300, so we'll be at 1600 at the end of this month. But uh, as of last year, we were at 1300. That's just phenomenal. I mean, really. Okay. Otherwise, they looked great. Thanks again for doing that. You're such a, a, a trooper. <laughs> oh, thanks. It helps me like get all the details down, so I don't mind it so much. I love having them as a reference. Uh, fantastic. Well, we have. Uh, minutes uh, to be submitted. Do we have a motion to accept these minutes as amended? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes with the one change uh, that I recommended. Thank you, John. I'll second that. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, all those in favor of accepting minutes as amended, say aye, yay, whatever have you. Aye. <laughs> I can hear you, Kenzie, even though I can't see you. Fantastic. You I know, your video is acting funky. That's so. about <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, thank you, Amanda. And we are in a transition uh, between treasures. So we will be uh, waiting. I mean, really the treasury report only needs to happen about once a quarter. Um, so, and I believe there have been no significant uh, uh, changes to the treasury in the last, since last meeting or since the last time it was discussed, so. Yeah, we do have, and Tom, tell me if it's uh, appropriate to bring it up now, but it's related to, to finances. Um, uh, and John has details on this too, but um, this is a number of number of months ago um, related to the mask uh, program. Um, we dedicated five hundred dollars, I think, right? Correct. Or approved the five hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, and I think we promised uh, the program at the end of the year that we would get the check or the okay. money to them. Okay. Um, so we. Need just do that, um, and it's uh, and we can talk about the details of, of amount and and who to send it to. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, we can discuss those uh, uh, either either now. Let, uh, let me try and get. Uh, are they? Uh, do they need it this week? We need to get it. I, I don't know if it's this week, but I definitely in January sometime because okay. what has happened? Like it was a. Um, yeah. Joy, who is kind of our point person mm -hmm. here in Central Beaverton, was working with a group, um, a, a Mason Masonic group, right. and they pulled out a couple months ago. So she's just been doing them on her own, and she's actually just been buying all the fabric and stuff with her mm. own money. Okay. Yeah. And I'm like, no, Joy, you no, let absolutely. Us, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get you that. And so she was like, that would be really helpful. So okay. um, I think as soon as we can get that five hundred dollars, uh, then I think I think we'd be golden. Uh, well, Quinn, I'll work on coordinating it with you and uh, uh, Ryan, and then one way or the other, um, even if it's a, uh, I don't mind, I can uh, pay out and, and then just get reimbursed or something similar. We'll, uh, we'll get it taken care of before the, uh, definitely before the end of the month and hopefully before the end of the week. At least some, some more information. Great. Fantastic. Okay. And for the rest of you all, I'll, um, yeah, we tried to coordinate before this meeting on handoff and transfer of accounts and things, and I um, uh, hadn't heard back yet. So promise I'll have a report for you uh, next <laughs> month. That is just fine. And one of the reasons that we're excited to have a new, a new officer. So, well, thank you for that. And uh, that then brings us to the next item, which is the neighborhood review meeting uh, of the renovation of the sales and service buildings at Car Subaru. And I will turn the meeting over to Stephen Gerber. And Mr. Gerber, you have the ability to share your screen, whatever manner you need. And looking forward to it. All right. Good morning, Adam. 
All right. Hello, my name is Stephen Gerber. I've been working with Car Subaru for the last few years on a uh, couple projects, trying to figure out how to how to expand their uh, service and particularly their service side of things. But uh, they've decided to uh, expand their sales as well. And so let me get my. There we go. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the existing conditions first. And so I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, Car Subaru. It's at 11. 635 Southwest Canyon Road. Um, here's a, this is a uh, existing site plan. We have kind of the, the existing showroom slash sales building, our existing service, main service building. And then we have a annex, service annex building that we did about 10 years ago. And currently the site um, is accessed from Canyon Road here near the main service building. And there's also an, an apron or an access right at this, this uh, future intersection for what is to become, I guess, 115th at some point. But, but there's an access point here and then an access point there. Um, the site's, the, the, um, site's kind of deficient in both the way the automobile accesses it and as well as the pedestrian. It's really not very uh, pedestrian friendly. Um, Real quick on the, the main service building, just it's it essentially houses some some lists for cars, parks area, and there's a small lounge for for customers. And then again, the second floor is more just uh, support support functions, and then uh, then the annex in the back. For renovations, not that you, if y'all have been there, uh, here we go. Here's a, here's a shot of what it currently looks like. And then and then on our sales building in the back of the, the site there, we have just this small little space for, for showroom and the rest is sales offices and, and uh, support functions. And as you can see, it's, it, this is what it looks like currently. Um, we've worked with, uh, well, Greg, Greg, I'm working with Greg Hankin. He's uh, the building designer and uh, kind of liaison to Car Subaru. And then we've, uh, Subaru has worked with, um, Car Subaru has worked with this uh, Feltus Hawkins design to do some of the, the renderings and, and kind of um, nail down the requirements that, that Subaru is gonna need for the next 10 years in their uh, improved building here. So here, here we are with the uh, new site plan and here's the, in, the enlarged ser uh, sales building. And here we have the enlarged service building. And um, as I mentioned before, the part of our, our project We've, uh, we're going to have to re revamp the, the site plan a little bit um, to kind of meet current, current standards, one of which is, is uh, making make it more pedestrian friendly, pedestrian accessible. We're going to be we're providing a kind of change in, change in uh, paving materials from Canyon to, to get to the front door of the service building. We're going to be extending the sidewalk along this, this uh, easement. To, and we actually shifted the, um, the main entry apron into the site to align with this, what we call the, the service aisle. And this was um, at, at the request of kind of, or request of the city, coordination with the city, uh, it was determined that we needed a loading berth and our, the way we were loading and unloading, we had to do it off, off site. So this, this shift does a few things. It allows us, it allows us easy access for the fire trucks, easy access for the delivery trucks, Especially, we're going to be building a new uh, little loading berth at the end of this uh, this uh, service building annex, and then we're also going to be doing this walk, a path through the whole site that'll kind of link link the the sales building to the to the service building. Um, here's the the sales building, as you can tell here in red. This is where the back of the existing building is. So essentially, we're going to blow out the back wall. And add a bunch of, of sales offices. You know, the, the, the shift is online sales. So we really need more, more sales space for the online sales crew. So um, in doing so, we're getting more offices, we're getting some more, more training, lunchroom space. We're also enlarging our, our indoor showroom, which they very much are lacking. Um, the the aesthetic of it actually <laughs> in doing this. In doing this, this addition, um, Subaru is requiring that we we upgrade the the front of the building to meet their current standards, which, in reality, it's very similar to what's there. This is a rendering by that uh, other firm, Feltus Hawkins, and it's just essentially some of the some of the scale proportions changed 
on their on their uh, their uh, elevation. So we're we're going to be upgrading that. That'll be all new. Um, the the main portion of the project is the service the service side of things. As I mentioned before, you know here's the existing. We're we're looking to add a a covered entry area. So for people that are coming in for long term service, you know something they're having to leave their car for for a long period of time, they can pull in. They can undercover, meet with the with the crew, get everything lined out, and either wait in the wait in the uh, upgraded lobby area, or or come back later. But essentially, we're creating the similar covered area on the other side for Express Quick Lube, so it's more of just oil change, something more in and out, and um, and then also we're looking to add seven more automobile lifts in the back here, opposite the annex because uh, we're one of the largest Subaru service dealerships in the region and, and we're just, <laughs> we're just need, need more space to service all the, all the, the new and existing customers. Um, second floor is still not gonna change much. It's pretty much similar, similar uses. Um, exterior wise, we're gonna reskin re the, whole, the whole building. Um, now it'll, it'll essentially become here we go. So this is so this is the front front elevation facing canyon, and this is a rendering of that that elevation. We're reskinning the whole the whole surface of the building, so it'll all be this corrugated dark gray metal. But then utilize the the Subaru branding with the the silver metal panel and the and the blue accents, and then uh, the required signage. So this is facing canyon. This is the elevation facing facing um, 115th. And here's kind of an aerial bird's view shot of the facility. Just, just the service side of things. Here's a shot from the, uh, the access from Canyon. One of the main elements of this building, I think the last neighborhood meeting we did like a year, year and a half ago maybe, there was an older gentleman there that mentioned, he remembered this building being designed by a, a local architect and that this rotunda was some an element that was kind of key to his a lot of some of his or his style. So we uh, we we've kind of embellished the rotunda a bit. We've uh, it is currently two story, but only one store is accessible. It's now it's only a one story space. It's now become a two story space, and it allows us to put a um, a big reader board for graphics and and advertisement within the space. Um, what is that? And here's just kind of the money shot of the of the big rotunda. Uh, the just FYI, and we cur currently our our uh, site we do not meet the minimum FAR. So uh, part of our applications, we're going to have to do the uh, what is it the design review build out concept build out plan. And so we were we were looking you know just showing kind of currently what what's going on on the site. And then you know, per the per the code or the zoning code, you know the city's really wanting to make this more pedestrian friendly. And so maybe you know in the future we'd look to uh, maybe redevelop a portion of the site while maintaining another part. You know the 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 main car building, you know, utilize it for its business, and then build up some some mixed use. And then in the end, convert the whole site into some sort of mixed use development that would be more in tune with uh, the current zoning code. Well, that's it. Uh, if you guys have any questions, can you hear them? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just looking because this uh, didn't seem like a, a familiar project, and I know we uh, couldn't remember if it was you that we saw back. I think it was it was definitely over a year ago. It was probably closer to two. Yeah, yeah uh, at the uh, at the uh, swimming pool. Yeah, exactly. Yes. yes. Um, and so, with that in mind, a lot of this looks like uh, kind of. It doesn't look like there's a lot that is different about this particular plan. It's definitely more detailed. Is this just a continuance of the, the planning uh, process or is this, were there additional changes to the project that required another neighborhood review? Uh, there were, there were, well, we, when we came in, I believe, I guess we did have a bit of the sales. We weren't, we weren't gonna do as much to the sales in that proposal that we showed you way back when but then uh, Subaru corporate got involved and, and was looking to, to try to bring the whole site up. And they made the decision just to, to do both these together, both the service and sales. So, that, so um, that's why we, we came back to you. 
and and this is by far the the service building is by far more uh, elaborate than I think what we presented to you last time as well as far as the, the front end of it the front side of it we, I don't know that we had the I don't remember if we had the covered areas or not but this is most it, it's fairly similar All right. I have a couple questions Tom go for it uh, um, and, and it's kind of a two-parter of the same thing uh, well maybe a three-parter are we losing any trees on the site um, part A. Part B, is there an opportunity to plant more trees somewhere? And part C, um, uh, there's a lot of roof space that's unused. Any opportunity to do like green roofs or solar panels or anything that can address climate uh, in a car dealership, I think would be helpful. I don't know if they have the budget and I know those are not cheap things, but um, just kind of a comment, I guess. Well, A, I will, uh, I will ask the question about the uh, alternative energies and ways to, or green roofs or ways to, to utilize the, the large roof. Um, that's right on brand with Subaru. <laughs> right, well, that's true. Um, uh, tree, trees, actually, one thing I forgot to mention was um, along, along Canyon Highway, we now have an eight foot sidewalk with I think a four foot, four or five foot uh, landscaping strip. And some of the tr trees are actually in that eight-foot sidewalk, and so part of our uh, part of our project is we're gonna we're gonna widen that sidewalk to the tip, make it the uh, code required ten feet, and then we are gonna actually move those trees out of the sidewalk and, and yes, replant those in that that landscaping strip along Canyon Road, and then along a uh, hundred and fifteenth, we're you know part of it is to to address some of those zoning requirements of dressing that corner up and part of that is adding some street trees and more landscaping so you'll notice that in this image you know at this corner right in here so so we are and, and then we are adding trees within the site itself if you notice there are some uh, landscaping islands shown in this this rendering and we are we are uh, incorporating those again to help with our landscaping percentages yeah, any uh, chance we can take to increase it. We've heard consistently from neighbors that uh, people are really concerned with canopy loss and tree loss, particularly in the urban core and in our commercial areas. Um, you know, a lot of, especially our work in the last 20, 30 years, a lot of the trees weren't all that great because they lifted up the sidewalk and they just got rid of them instead of replacing them. So uh, we're just looking for partners to really increase canopy whenever we can. So I appreciate you guys doing that. Great. Yeah, question. yeah, I just had a, I guess, somewhat related question. Um, most auto manufacturers are obviously within the next 10 years, which I think is the time frame you mentioned with this project, are moving more, even more towards electric vehicles. So I was wondering if, uh, if you know what the electric vehicle infrastructure changes are going to be with this addition, um, within service, and also you kind of showed us uh, a little bit of an acknowledgement of kind of the broader um, public space um, and retail uh, potential for the future. I was wondering if there's any plan for uh, public electric vehicle infrastructure to be added to this plan. Actually, the uh, the current site plan. Let me jump back. The current site plan in front of in front of the sales building. We were showing for uh, oh, we were showing four, three or four locations for, for charging electric vehicles. But beyond that, uh, I, we haven't talked a whole bunch about, about the, the future of the electrical car other than just incorporating that. Go ahead. Are there other things uh, you know of? Or, Yes. Yeah. So, uh, for instance, um, like, well, Tesla is a little bit ahead of the game, but their showroom at Washington Square Mall has um, a broader set of chargers that are publicly accessible and not just for service vehicles, for instance. Um, and I see. I see that trend being with, um, you know, the rest of the auto manufacturers. It's just, it's just a thought because you talked about kind of, um, kind of 
a little bit further from the core of the sales and, and service area and and considering and future proofing for that area. So um, I think it would be a good idea for uh, for Subaru and the group to just think about what their kind of future proofing electric vehicle infrastructure considerations are. Okay. So you're so are you uh, describing you would have some charging stations say closer to the, the street or that are more accessible to the public to use. Is that is that the idea? Yeah, my guess is my guess is first priority is whatever the infrastructure is for the sales or for the service uh, department. Mm -hmm. Knowing that Subaru is coming out with more electric vehicles, but yeah, I guess what I'm interested in is from a public. I think it would be an amazing gesture and a, a statement to have part of that infrastructure be accessible to the public, especially because these plans consider kind of the, the the space further away from the core of the sales and service that is part of the public space. Yeah. I see. I understand. Well, I've, uh, I've jotted it down and uh, cool. Thank I'll ask that question. Great. Um, I've got a quick question. Go for it. So Stephen, I feel kind of dumb asking this, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Um, do you know if there are any spaces allocated for like a bike rack or two? It is really close to the central area of Beaverton where there's a lot of new housing going in. And theoretically, it's possible you could have some employees who would want a bike to work instead. Granted, it's an awful biking corridor. So the demand might not be very high, but it's a passion of mine, but like I had to ask. <laughs> no, understood. And 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 actually, I think we've noted we we've, we've been working on this project for a long time, various parts and pieces of it. And we were doing the layout of this uh, the service building. I get I don't know if it was a year and a half ago or so, but I did add I did add uh, bike racks to the sales building, and I can't remember. I don't know if I have a place to show them, but I did have some interior racks. In the sales building, and I know we had an outdoor rack in the service building, but I believe the zoning code is going to require us to make sure we, we provide those amenities for the bikes. So we, for sure we will. Okay, thanks for humoring me. Appreciate no it, Steve. Understood. Uh, from, a, from a loaner vehicle perspective, Kevin, like that's a cool idea too. Like if less people decide to grab a loaner uh, Subaru vehicle while their cars in service can go bike instead. I think that that might help with that in some a way. A loaner bike, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, have a have a Nike bikey put uh, a station there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, there's a, a garage in Portland that does that where I've gotten my car service before, where they'll they'll give you a bike to go explore the neighborhood while you're waiting for your car. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Which one is that? Uh, Green Drop. That's cool. That is cool. Uh, so, for those of us who are tangentially, uh, uh, who uh, whose land use um, and development knowledge doesn't usually extend too far past this uh, neighborhood review meeting uh, type thing, that last bit of your presentation you mentioned was uh, with the development of, of residential and, uh, and mixed use was yeah. in relation to FAR requirements. Would you mind right. giving me a, a quick, uh, and, and anybody else who's unfamiliar with it, a little bit of explanation about what that, what that acronym is and kind of what it means to the- so it's, so it's the overall overall size of the site, which is, I forget, 183,000. Uh, you, you take the square footage of your buildings, divide by the overall square footage of your site, and that gives you a, a percentage of your site that's being used. And I, I from, from the hip, don't remember what the, if it was 5%, I don't remember the numbers offhand. I just know that we, because our site's so large and we rely on, you know, um, uh, the, the parking lots for, for all our automobiles, that we just, we don't come close to meeting the effort. I think we're halfway there, maybe, maybe two thirds of the way there. So, even when we do add this square footage, both, both you know, in the service building and here at the sales, I think we're still going to be short a little bit on the, on that FAR requirement. So, so did did I answer your question on that? So I think FAR is floor area ratio. Is ratio, that, uh, yes. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, yeah. In, yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of fulfilling that requirement, I know that you. Uh, there was some addition on there, and I asked because we definitely need more housing and and more 
uh, you know, small business opportunity in the central Beaverton location. And I, I do have to say, we see the dealerships come into because they're all uh, located in, in central and we see them improving their facilities. And this is the first time that I've seen anyone come in with a plan to actually either turn some of their square footage, so, you know, lot space over to, uh, uh, to residential and, and different commercial or to even plan on, and someday this dealership may not even be there. This is, this is kind of blowing my mind here. Um, so there's two questions about that is, <laughs> um, uh, one is, is there any type of, what's the kind of time requirement that the city or has they, have they placed one on the, on development in order to fulfill that? Um, and um, then I completely forgot the second part of that question, but maybe you can, no. can focus on the first part. No, no, they, they don't, they don't put a time constraint on us. It's just more, we acknowledge that we don't meet the FAR and that we're, we're thinking about what this site could be in the future because we know we, we're, we're, we're having to go in for conditional use at, um, applications. We've, we've got the service approved as conditional use, but the sale we're going to go in for to get approved for uh, conditional use because open, open sales lots like this aren't allowed inside city, um, per, you know, allowed in cities anymore they literally are sure starting yeah, to push I mean, people to it's build very, them <laughs> yeah very valuable so, real estate so, for everybody right yeah yeah and, well and i just think the owners understand we you know, we understand that that in the long run we've got to that we are get we're going to have to look futuristically and so i i don't think there's anything tying us to it which just showing that we're we're showing that we're thinking about it in relation to what the city wants i I'm not sure how to answer that. Oh, no, no, that's great. I, did, I didn't know if they tied uh, further development approval or, or any type of other, if, if there were contingencies that required you to, say, within a certain time frame, start to start oh, to address no, that not, if they are. Not so, yet. <laughs> yeah, not not yet. Not that I know of yet. But but no. It, no there's just, not time. I'm sorry. There's not time that? constraints. It's just to show. Um, there aren't time constraints for this, but it's to show that the development they're proposing doesn't um, exclude that from happening in the future. Yeah. Right, so see. they're not plopping down, you know, a multi-million dollar tiny building on this vast site that could be used for something else later in the line. I see. Um, that it's it's completely reasonable to expect that it could be developed at some point. I see. Okay, that's a little bit uh, that. That's good clarification. But I do appreciate that. Uh, so was that inclusion at, at uh, Subaru's request or the dealership's request or just? No, it's the own? city, city, the city's request. I, I just, I, I'm asking that uh, in, of the other dealerships, which are large score, other other large square footage uh, um, uh, businesses that are, are in the same zone, none of them that I recall have ever included this type of future development possibility in their proposals. So well, I'm just curious as to, to uh, uh, either why they omitted or, um, or you guys were able to or thought to include. I, I, think, I think because we've been working on this project for, <laughs> for a while, uh, we, we might be a bit ahead of the game for this presentation. And so I, I just included that knowing that in the end, we're gonna have to do this presentation to the board at some point. And so I, I had the information. I thought I'd share it. <laughs> so maybe those other folks just don't share it. I don't yeah, know. no, no. I, I appreciate it. I really appreciate the fact that there's that the that the other you know these other members of the community are in fact looking that a the city is 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 responsible for this and and is is uh, fulfilling their requirements of being stewards of public and private spaces and that uh, developers and architects are are. Um, are taking that to heart and then are yeah. and, you know showing that off. I think it just to me it's it's a it's a sign of, of good faith that we're you know all in this together as a community, whether it be Subaru and Central Beaverton or you know Beaverton Town Square or whomever. So uh, were there other questions or comments for Mr. Gerber? Um, just one for the public record. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a limb here and say the Subaru dealerships are kind of on the edge of downtown. 
more in a very suburban part of downtown. So I, I, I'm okay with this. I think if this were the Kia dealership or the Ford dealership, we're, it's going to be a very different conversation because like those two businesses materially interact, interact and uh, uh have a very different relationship with the urban fabric and the core of downtown than the Subaru dealership does. And I think we, so I, I just want for the public record that like in a, in a suburban place, um, and I, I know we have to think long-term, uh, uh, I, I think the Subaru is a very different dealership than the other two right in the core. And, and I just don't want this to be precedent, right. That we can just kind of accept giant floor area ratio discrepancies, that sort of thing. Just in case anyone's watching from those other areas. And that is all. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> you bet. Well put. Well, thank you all for your time. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. You bet. All right, uh, getting my own agenda back in place. So uh, last week or last month, we had uh, begun the discussion of community projects to pursue in 2021. I know we've still got a lot of public health uh, hurdles um, to uh, surmount before we can really plan on a lot of uh, big in-person uh, gatherings, but uh, we had some great ideas um, and uh, I just allocated this time to continue discussing the ideas that had been brought up uh, as well as kind of open things up uh, to um, uh, the discussion of new ideas that we could be pursuing as the uh, Central Beaverton Neighborhood Association to serve the Central Beaverton neighborhood and, um, and Beaverton in general. So with that, um, I will maybe start off by querying uh, Amanda and John about uh, do you were you able to have any further discussion about the scavenger hunt, the art scavenger hunt idea that uh, was uh, brought forth in December? Uh, no, I believe what we decided was that subcommittees would be formed this meeting um, just so that we could make sure that everything was above board and then people could be empowered to go work on things in between meetings. Sure, absolutely. Well, this is the, uh, this is the, the venue in which to uh, start doing that. Kevin. Um, I just want to jump in really quick because I think Kenzie said she had to leave at eight. Yes. And um, if it's okay with you all, if Kenzie has any ideas, I'd love to hear from her before she has to leave. That's a great point. I have, I'm going to put on the video for the last. I appreciate it. I, I've been thinking, but I don't necessarily have any ideas. I was kind of also on Amanda's note thinking about the subcommittee piece of it. So maybe it's going to be hard because I have to jump, but <laughs> maybe I can be put on a subcommittee, what you guys think will be best. And um, I can engage there. Sorry, I'm not. <laughs> it's kind of inconvenient being on the East Coast right now. Understandable. Um, yeah, I know we had a number of projects that are listed in the minutes from last month and right. Um, so I think what may be prudent is to um, so we don't either uh, so we prevent ourselves from either not doing too little, you know, doing less than we can, uh, or even worse, over committing and then either not getting anything done or or not getting you know the kind of quality things around is um, amongst our, ourselves. Uh, I think we can do more than just you know we can do maybe one or two things for the year and have time to adequately plan and uh or I mean, maybe even two or three uh, and i guess that's the the kind of what i where i'm at right now is uh, as a group how how much do we want to take on um um for this year and obviously we depending on how things go um we can uh either prune from uh, from plans or add to plans as things work out. But rather than forming five subcommittees to pursue every everything that was um, suggested last month or you know one subcommittee because we just started talking about uh, art um, scavenger hunt and then that that takes away the, the discussion from the, the rest of, the, of our time tonight. Um, Miles has a uh, 
as a uh, interjection. I do. I'm sorry. That's quite um, all right. I don't know if Francesca told you guys about um, the shred event that Highland did. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, I was just thinking as you were talking along those lines of there are events that you can do that are totally virtual um, and are also kind of low barrier. Right. And just to be thinking along those lines too. I haven't seen your list. I yeah, didn't read no. them in it. I'm sorry, Amanda. Um, I will read them though. And um, so it doesn't have to be a shred event, but just thinking along those lines of like performing a service or that you can do kind of in person, but not in person. Right. Just throwing uh, it out there. Yeah, I think uh, for the um, for those of us who uh, are in the same position as Miles, were not in attendance last month, or uh, didn't uh, either read or have access to the the minutes. Um, there was uh, some projects that were initially brainstormed were uh, having an art scavenger hunt that was uh, kind of a some, yes, Amanda. I have the last month's minutes pulled up. If you want me to run through the list of everything that was sure, proposed. that'd be great. Okay, um, so the the first initial ideas for things we could pursue in 2021 were exploring areas where homeowners can help us create more walkable pathways in our community, um, doing a virtual scavenger hunt to encourage walking neighborhoods and supporting local businesses, thinking multi-week so it encourages multiple connection points, partnering with local artists for hidden pieces of public art um, similar to Schiffler Park's message garden with THPRD, and they have painted rock kits available that they could help us with this project. Um, keeping in mind that we should integrate our mission of engaging more diverse communities throughout any activity that we choose, and also proposed we're a, doing a dump event, which has been requested by community members, and possibly doing a blood drive because there's a lack of them in the Beaverton area. Right, so we've got some, uh, some potential here, mm -hmm. but I don't want to preclude um, uh, community members if they've got, uh, or, or any anybody else who's had more time to think about it. Um, uh, if there are further suggestions, John, go for it. Yeah, I think we should. I think we should do a couple things. First, we should up level, and I think uh, instead of forming like a scavenger hunt committee or a subcommittee, I think what we should do is have potentially two or maybe three subcommittees. And this is what I would propose. Number one, uh, an event subcommittee that would look at neighborhoods and max sponsored events throughout the year. Uh, and the bandwidth would change depending on, you know, month to month or quarter to quarter. Uh, but that subgroup could work on a scavenger hunt or maybe a small event later, like a trash uh, uh, like the thing we did in Highland or a blood drive, something like that, that would all fit under the subcommittee. I think we should have a standing art subcommittee that kind of work, works uh, public art things, uh, works with the downtown association on murals, that sort of thing, uh, just promoting and advancing the cause of public art. Uh, and then kind of the third, so there'd be an event, pub, uh, art, and then I think the third one um, that's kind of near and dear to my heart and that, that, that I've thought about since um, the last meeting is, is and I'm calling this a long-term um, subcommittee. Uh, it's not events-based, but I was thinking, you know, we, it, it, as a NAC, we often sponsor certain groups in the neighborhood to do things. We give grants. We do all of that. Um, I would really like for us to have a long-term vision around something like maybe sustainability. That's where my heart goes. Like, like, can the neighborhood be leading the push for our neighborhood to be more sustainable? Meaning let's partner with businesses to do things like compost, compostable stuff, maybe some public composting here, you know, things that we can take the lead on very small scale projects around creating like a downtown eco district kind of thing uh, to get that started. And that's not going to happen over a few months, you know, that's going to take maybe a small couple small steps will, but that's that's more of a two or three year project realistically. Uh, and so I think we that would be my third recommendation is is let's get you know get a group together and start talking about what we can do for that longer term period. All right. Um, so I think we're open for discussion right now. Their thoughts about what uh, John is uh, proposing. Yeah, sorry, I'm just gonna jump back to the hop right after this. Okay. Um, 
Can you wait? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I just want to say I really like that idea of the bigger buckets of committees and um, kind of creating even going off sustainability, but more sustainable change and just having that better integrated approach rather than doing one-off events because we can carry those throughout and obviously as we learn through the the subcommittee those broader subcommittees we can figure out if we want to tailor them a specific way um so i just really like that idea and i also like the sustainability aspect i, I work in sustainability so i always love that <laughs> um so i just wanted to chime in with those two points before i hop off but I'm sorry, I always have to leave right when the good group discussion comes on events. But, <laughs> and uh, I'll look at the minutes after to get caught up. But bye. Thanks, Kenzie. See you. Uh, let's see. Rachel Phillip has raised her hand. So I believe you are uh, talking permitted and uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hey, uh, Rachel. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Um, yeah, um, I just want to say I really like that idea of like sort of committees that own own these projects and I the idea of like a sustainable sustainability committee uh, really speaks to me as well and the other if we're exploring that path the other thing that would be great to focus on is like how can our neighborhood uh, really reach out to the other to basically get more involvement like I mean, I happen to know about this meeting because I live next to John and Quinn. Um, so like how, how, but like, I don't know, like if we, if we just go like neighbor to neighbor, it's like gonna take years until like all, like all of our road like attends these meetings. And like, I don't know if there's some way like we can figure out a way, like show people that like getting involved with the city and like these committees and like speaking up at these things actually has an impact and actually does change our lives like I don't I don't know how to do that because I, I just started getting involved but like the more we can do that the better and like I think the more the more good ideas we'll see coming out of it yeah Rachel one um one thing that the um Highland Act did each uh each month like a week I think a few days prior to the NAC meeting was um we had signs that just advertised that the date of the meeting, the time, and how to um, where to go at that point. But this would need to be how to have a log on. But um, I, I could find out a little bit more about how how effective those were and have been for Highland, and see if that's a, just a really simple way for us to to kind of put the word out each month um, for the for the purpose of, of NAC participation. That would be great, and also just hearing like what our people in our neighborhood concerned about like I mean I think John really spoke to some of the things I'm concerned about with like sustainability um but like I you know if we heard more about you know if people came with the idea that like they are coming in order to like make make their voice heard and like maybe actually something will happen I think that is like much more powerful than like come to our meeting <laughs> you know because I think yeah. sometimes it's opaque what's going to happen here and if anything will be the outcome. So even maybe if it's like a listening session where people get to come and say, hey, this is what I'm concerned about, that might, that might convince people like, hey, this is a worthwhile use of my hour and a half on a weekday evening. Yeah, no, the single most impactful and important thing we can do, Rachel and, and everyone, and this is years of being in these groups, is we can do things in the community and people will see that we are doing things and they will want to do those things with us. Unfortunately for us, this is a reasonably newer board with some new chemistry. We got a lot of really engaged active people and then COVID happened. Uh, I remember very much the last year at the beginning, we had this whole planning session and meeting. We were gonna go to the food carts and do all this yep. and then we couldn't, right? right? And we've been hamstrung by that, but, but uh, we, we've got to adapt to the world, right? Like we, we can sit around and complain or we can adapt to it. And I, I think, the energy I feel from this group, I just want to give it to everyone else because I want them to experience it because they'll come every month too. But in order for us to do that, we've got to just do things, right? And yeah, we've got yeah, to absolutely. show people yeah. that their neighborhood matters and that their, their, their neighborhood is doing things, their NAC is doing things, and we're engaging people. Um, that's how we make this sustainable long-term in, in everything I've experienced. Can I interject, do you mind? Absolutely. You can say no. I'll be quiet. 
Um, <laughs> I think either Rachel works with volunteers or just innately knows something because um, she had a lot of good points. Um, I'm working on a couple of projects right now and some of my res research on engaging volunteers, um, actually asking your neighbor to come to the meeting is the best way to get somebody to come to a meeting, the personal ask um, mm -hmm. is really effective. And people don't volunteer who aren't asked um, generally. I mean, once in a while they stumble upon us, um, but usually it's somebody asking them to come to a meeting with them. Um, and, and John's right too about um, when you are inviting somebody to a meeting or talking about the knack with somebody, if you can relate to relate to them what tangible things you've done and the way it's affected you um, personally or affected someone else personally, um, that really engages the motivation of people to 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 get more involved and to think about how to get involved. Um, just saying, you know, I, I know the snacks have done great things. I know Highland's done great things. A lot of the snacks have, but talking about what that means to somebody who participated in an event or, um, or who was an attendee, what it, what it meant to them to be able to do something, um, even if it's small. And it sounds cheesy, but that is, that is what resonates with people um, and encourages them to volunteer further. Um, so John got Rachel, he's only got a neighbor on one side. So Rachel, you gotta get the neighbor next to you now. <laughs> okay, sounds good. You're um, up, Rach. Miles, sorry, I'm just really good. Oh, Miles, I like the idea of um, thinking about what what you were able to accomplish or what the NAC was able to accomplish with you as a good exercise. Um, I wonder. I wonder if that might be a quick for next month, a quick little exercise we can all do. Like, I know sometimes in the past, Highland, you came up with like um, an exercise at the beginning to just introduce yourself to the NAC. Like right now we just quickly introduce ourselves. And if we have a role in an NAC, we say it. I wonder if for next month, we each of us thinks about just really something quick and simple in terms of what, um, what attracted us to the NAC or what we felt we um, accomplished in the NAC or what tangible thing happened in the NAC that has just made us want to stick with it. Um, and I think we could all kind of quickly come up with an idea. Um, and that could kind of kind of maybe set the stage for how we could express that outwards as, yeah. as part of the plan. Yeah. That's exactly what that's for. It's, it's, we do so much that it's really easy to, when, when you do a lot, it seems like you don't do much because you're just so involved in doing stuff. So it's a, it's a good reminder of all the things that we've done and that we continue to do because, you know, if we just get it, make it the default to engage people in conversations around the NAC and neighborhood and uh, then, then, you know, it's just, Oh, Amanda said this, you know, or, or Tom said this last month and it's just on my mind. It's, I, I don't have to even think about it. It's just mm -hmm. part of the conversation. I think that's, it's going to be critical. <clears throat> I would love to capture that that testimonial as well um, for my for the city's use, but I'd love to steal it from you and use it in other ways um, to okay. for, for promotion of the NACs um, on the website or maybe your city article. Um, really learning, leaning more towards that type of recruitment effort than just a shotgun approach. Uh, everybody come to the NAC. It's a great thing to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't even, I think it's a fool's errand to try and get everybody to come to the, to the, the NAC. I, mean, we, I think we want as many people as we, we can. We want a good representation. I think in some cases we want a, a more uh, equitable and realistic representation uh, in particular right now. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know that you can convince people uh, until they think that they're stakeholders in, in the community whether that be on the city side and in, in, informally, then you're not going to get them to, to, to come. So I, I guess that we, we, we've now, we've, we've pivoted a little bit in our, our uh, discussion and that's great. Um, um, but so I'm just going to real quick then ask our, one of our, our kind of our, our, our newer ones um, 
Fran Miller, I know that uh, uh, you have been previously been part of the NAC and the board, so I'm, um, uh, uh, you can add anything that you would like at any time. But let me ask first, Rachel, so just because John said, hey, come to this NAC meeting, what actually brought you here? Why, why, did, you, why did you decide it was a good idea? Yeah, so I've been attending partly just to know like what's going on and also just voice, you know, any thoughts that I have, like, I think, I think the first NAC meeting, someone from the city was here presenting on sort of the vision for the urban redevelopment plan. And they talked about sort of looking through like a, a racial and um, class like equity lens. And like, it was great to be able to share like, I think that's great. And like, I would also love to see like a sustainability lens. So I, I've been coming because, you know, I never, I don't, I don't know how soon the agenda gets put out. I usually just look the night of, but just to be able to hear what's going on and potentially say something about what, what is going on if I have that opportunity. Um, I think part of what I'm doing though is still figuring out like what the NAC can do. Like, I think that part is still a little opaque to me. Like what, what does the NAC accomplish? Um, I know that we have funds, but I don't know where those funds come from and like how much of those we have. Um, so even just like understanding like what, what can the NAC accomplish, um, I think would be really powerful and potentially like get more people involved. Cool, thank you for sharing. Uh, and Ms. Miller, I, I actually realized in, in retrospect, I apologize, I spoke for you uh, rather than asking you to relate your own uh, experience. So would you be willing to share uh, with us what initially brought you to the to participate in the, the Central Beaverton NAC? And if you would prefer to abstain, then that's fine too. Uh, or Mr. Uh, Howard, yeah, Mr. Howard, if you would like to, uh, to oh, tell okay. uh, Yeah, it's been a while since I attended one of these. Um, been in Beaverton for over 40 years, my current address was 33, and I kind of wanted to, uh, I'm retired now, and I get the uh, NAC newsletter, been getting that for years, I thought I would just log on and find out what's going on. Great, yeah, again, we're, we're uh, happy to have you. And again, uh, oh, I think Ms. Miller, I see you now uh, unmuted, so. Uh. <laughs> um, I was interested in getting involved in the community when we first moved here. Okay. And I uh, attended a number of meetings. I didn't realize that uh, if you weren't a board member, you weren't supposed to vote. But it really was a lot of uh, direction of the, the lead, the chair was interested in the theater. And so he was promoting some projects with that pretty unilaterally. And um, then we got a new head and she didn't think anybody should be on the board unless they were secretary, treasurer, chair, or vice chair. <coughs> so people had re recruited from our independent living facility uh, were told that they need not be on the board anymore. And so they lost interest that way. Um, so uh, Roberta Ulrich, of course, was really the one with the project with the books for the school. And I think that was the best thing that the, uh, the board did. But I'd be happy to post um, information about the meetings upcoming and talk to some of the people who were on the board from here before. Excellent. Thank you for, uh, for sharing that with us. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Brandon, I think you'll find uh, this is a different board. We want, we want our board and our group to look like our community. If you live here, we want you here. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I've been very impressed with the board you have now. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, we'll, uh, maybe we, we'll take this opportunity to kind of circle back to uh, 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 the beginning of the conversation, and uh, which started with a. Uh, uh, I mean, this is all towards the how do we serve our community, and so with the specific of of what kind of events are we looking to do uh, to uh, encourage that both just to, because good works are their own reward, but they're also excellent advertising. Um, and uh, so with that in mind, John had suggested forming uh, a dedicated events subcommittee, for example, to, to, to kind of um, uh, do this. And um, what, uh, 
uh, my question, I guess, for you on that idea was what scope uh, do you, were you envisioning the, the subcommittee to have? I, I think personally from, from subcommittees I've been on at mm -hmm. Mac and in private enterprise, like I think the less rules we give them, the more effective they will be in determining themselves. Um, I think if you're interested in an event and planning them and putting them on, uh, that doesn't mean you're on your own. Like, like it's all of our responsibility, but you will, you know, that maybe a group of maybe three to four people can take the lead on, on determining we have the scope and scale and budget to do three events this year. Uh, and they'll determine the three that we do or recommend to the bigger board, uh, you know, hmm. and then the bigger board will determine the three. Um, so, so my inclination would be, and I'm open to, you know, to being wrong about this, but that we don't chain them very much. Let's just, let's, you know, agree that if, if you guys agree uh, that we form the subcommittees and, and give them leeway to kind of be creative and, you know, f figure out where we need to be. Because I have a lot of good ideas. I'm sure of a lot of other people do, but we could spend all night and never come to consensus. When, and that's the power of a subcommittee group. Mm -hmm. Let them let them get in the weeds, right? So I, I say we form the three or at least the three that I've, or, or we could do less or we could change those, but, but form those three subcommittees. Um, again, the art, the events, and then a, a, a kind of a long-term project. The first one would be focusing on sustainability. Amanda. I have a question. So are subcommittees open to only board members or are they open to anyone to join? Anyone at all can join them? Yeah, that's what I, was, I think. That's one of my favorite things about moving to a structure like this is because having subcommittees like this that have special interests, but also are at the heart of what the NAC board is wanting to see is the vision for Central Beaverton. It allows more people to see where they fit in. Because when I first started joining the NAC board, I had trouble figuring out where I fit because I was like, well, land use isn't really my thing or, and like, it seems like we get a lot of neighborhood review things. And so at first I really was just coming to like be a resident, understand what was going on and share what, what was going on in the arts community, because that was my connection. But I, I think that having something like this for, to go back to what we were talking about before, to say, hey, you know, you would be really great member of the events committee in the central Beaverton NAC because your skill set can be useful there. And then you can see that change that you're making. So I, I fully support moving forward with the idea of these subcommittees and maybe starting with these three. And if other opportunities present themselves at any point, we can adjust from there. But I think this is a good place to start. I'm just going to take one moment to interject and do a couple, oh, two points of clarification. One, yes, any subcommittee that we um, uh, uh, create is open to any of the general membership. Uh, it doesn't have to be board members only. It has to. The one restriction that I would say is that any subcommittee that is created and has independent meetings cannot contain any more than a cannot contain a quorum of board members, because that will mm -hmm. then. Uh, subject that to uh, being in a, uh, the public meeting laws. So, uh, and that's not to say that it, we can't do that. It just adds an additional degree of difficulty. And Miles, I think you have some something to add. Just, you're right on. And um, the final point is that they, the subcommittees would bring recommendations to the full board to vote on um, as an agenda item on the agenda um, during a public meeting. So, and that's, yeah. But you could hold your your subcommittee meetings without noticing them and as long as they're not making decisions for the board yes unless they've been right. empowered by the board to make those decisions like spending right but things. then they would be a public meeting okay yeah gotcha um yeah think of them as a, a, a kind of in the weeds recommendation you know they figure out all the recommendations bring it to the board we approve it and then they get back to work kind of thing like we, and, and that's where the public input part will come in, right? Like if, if they recommend something and there it's controversial, we can have that discussion. We can take the public in, input, make the decision then, and then it goes back to the subcommittee to do the work. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the only last thing to add is, especially for those who are either joining us and haven't been here for a while or uh, 
may not be uh, familiar with the, the board slash general membership structure. Uh, we are, uh, there are currently seven sitting members of the board. Um, we have our bylaws state that we can have a board of up to 20. So if uh, you can serve, you can help in the NAC as a general member, if you're interested in being more, uh, doing more and or becoming an officer, then there's room on the um, room on the board as well. So, and uh, we're, we're pretty, pretty we don't we're not just doing board elections once a year or anything at the moment we, i don't think we can really afford that um can i uh, can i make a recommendation then just for um uh discussion sake like um if you guys are okay with with the three boards that or subcommittees excuse me that we talked about um can we add an agenda item uh for next month for recruitment so people can think about it so they don't have to commit tonight. And plus we can kind of engage with people outside of the current board and the current current NAC that live in the neighborhood, that that work in the neighborhood, that might be interested in in participating and then maybe bring some names back next month. Uh, uh, and number two, I, th I would make a recommendation that any of the subcommittees have no more than three current uh, active board members. That way we don't run into public meeting laws uh, uh, with with quorum requirements and all it just makes it easier if we if we don't do that so what that realistically means is for the board members think really long and hard which ones you want to be on uh, and have a backup like if you're interested in a couple of them um, Pardon me. Um, so we've got some discussion uh, I, I, I do have so we uh, event we we've discussed a little bit um, art I'm just um, I'm seeking some, I know their, their ideas uh, rather than fully formed plans. So um, would you be willing to elaborate more on, on the other two uh, committees? I, I apologize if, if you. I yeah. them, oh, I was gonna say, I wrote them down in the minutes, what okay. you said, the events, art and sustainability. Right, so with arts and, and I mean, events, uh, it's, um, its purpose is pretty, is pretty straightforward. Um, in, in just in terms of, of recruitment, when we go to the community and say, hey, I'm the CV NAC and we're looking for more engagement from our community members, I think you would be great for the sustainability subcommittee if you wanted to join us. What am I going to tell them that, they, that they're going to be doing? So sustainability, I would recommend is, uh, it, it, it's going to take a holistic um, approach that's good, probably going to be multi-year. So it's, it's going to be like, uh, what, what is sustainability or, or kind of the Portland did a thing for a while and, and they didn't follow through, but looking at eco districts, um, a number of different things. If you think about it, though, it could be uh, uh, working with the city on designated bicycle lanes. It could be planting trees. It could be any, any sort of green initiative. There, there's kind of short term ones and there's long term ones, but it gives the committee kind of the view of of. Uh, if sustainability is our mission, um, that's not, we're not going to solve that in three months or 12 months, right? Like that has to be something that we, we work on from, for a long time. Um, so that's kind of the, the difference there. The events one's kind of self-explanatory, but, but I think, and I think you, what you may find is the events group, there might be sustainability events that we do oh, where yeah. those two groups could partner. Same with public art. But I think when I think of the art one, I think too, what is the art group? If, they're, if their charge is to increase public art in downtown Beaverton, maybe that's an opportunity for us to partner with like the downtown association and commission a mural somewhere, right? Or to uh, maybe partner with uh, the events group and put on a painted rock hidden thing. Or maybe they uh, commission an art to, to paint a street somewhere, right? Or, yeah, or lots of things. Or get more info on the water pump. Uh, building that's popping up at um, what the park, the park, city park, city park, and the get, pressure get more yeah. serious on what art installation is going to go either on that wall or around that area. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah and, and I it's worth mentioning really quick too because I immediately uh, got terrified of the uh, events subcommittee uh, for personal reasons. I'm not an event person, but I think that one, these are not separate entities. I mean, they are in terms of planning um, and the individuals in them. But for instance, 
really the one of the responsibilities of this event subcommittee could just be to help the other subcommittees activate their ideas right mm -hmm. um activate them into events essentially so it, it's more of a kind of a it could be a more of a kind of a connector role um and a collaborative role with the other subcommittees and just helping them kind of turn their ideas into um into activated you know community uh, connections so worth worth mentioning that in the minutes for for um when we try and recruit for right. these yeah. Yeah. because we do know that there and are I, I wanna, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of the community that does engage through the with the mac by reading the minutes so yeah i want to keep it very high level though i want to kind of keep it like like mission statement level though because mm -hmm. what i want to do is empower the groups to kind of figure this out for themselves like what is sustain like like something to the effect of like working to make sustainability more a thing in central beaverton right what does that mean that's for the subcommittee to figure out right? right working to make public art more of a priority in central beaverton what does that look like maybe it's sponsoring a theater show maybe it's painting something you know that's the subcommittee can figure that out and i think that's that'll be key is for us to keep it very very high level uh very strategic and let them be the tactical uh the tactical front <clears throat> if you guys are in agreement Kevin, we haven't heard from you in a little while. Do you have any thoughts on? I was just about to say that, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> you and I think alike. Uh, no, I don't have any thoughts. I like the subcommittee idea. Um, I'm like Quinn, not super engaged by event planning. <laughs> um, but I do think that this would be a really good way to invite the residents that I've run into where I do invite them to these meetings and they're like, that sounds awesome. And then they don't come. Uh, but if we were actually like, well, we actually are doing a mural project or we are painting this intersection or we are working on slowing the street and making it safer for you all. Like those are things that are more exciting for people, I think. Um, so I'd be supportive of this. Yeah, I think Kevin, you reminded me of, uh... I was just listening to the daily podcast today and it was interviewing Stacey Abrams and, um, but she had quickly mentioned, this sounds obvious maybe, but like if we meet our residents where they are um, and that is through these subcommittees, meet them where their interests lie and where they feel their skill sets are. I think this is a really great way to, um, to show them that they can get involved and feel that they can add value. The other one more point, and then I'll shut up because I've talked a lot tonight, but especially once we get vaccines widely available in the community, um, I have a lot of neighbors that live behind us in the retirement facility that are super active and engaged. And I feel like that's a massive resource that we're not tapping. Uh, number one of community knowledge and history, right? But but just people that, that um, would be a great, great partner for us to work with um, and partner and, and just be friends with, right? Like, like just get them involved and, and invite them to things and, and make sure they know that, that, you know, come be on our subcommittee for art. You know, I, I'm sure we have a lot of artists there. I'm sure we have a lot of fantastic, fabulous event planners there that would love to do some things. Uh, and, and I would love to get them involved too. Right. Fran, I'm not volunteering you, I promise, <laughs> but I might be. <laughs> yeah, I think there are people who want to be involved and frequently seniors are not allowed to volunteer. Uh, they're not wanted by the agencies when they're made to feel welcome and contributing. I think that would be a great call to them. Yeah, we, 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 we want them and we would be honored by their presence. Right, thanks. Of course, we have uh, Creekside Retirement Center right across the creek from where we are at Beaverton Lodge. One of our members uh, did remain as treasurer for several years on uh, the NAC board and did a great job. He's had some frustration mm -hmm. dealing with some other entities to get the work done and the, the mic lined up, but she was a great asset. And Fran, uh, I'll add that we want to re reduce and eliminate barriers for people participating. So if using a virtual platform like Zoom is a challenge, I think we should look at how we can help teach people yeah. how to use it. No, oh, that'd be great. Fran, let us know if anybody needs help and we can try to figure out how to walk them through it. 
Okay. Well, I struggle myself. I would just have them over here. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, yeah. I wonder, uh, Kevin, that brings up a good point. I wonder if we could engage with the actual entity, like the Creek, uh, the, the two or three retirement facilities. Um, and see if they can set up a community room or something. I know it, it's a little, you know, I don't know how with, with COVID and everything, but but thinking, you know, in the next, you know, post-vaccination era that, that you know, we, we, again, what Quinn said, meeting people where they are, like if, if Zoom is the way we're going to potentially do this, then, you know, maybe not everyone in those groups has to have their own personal computer. Maybe they can sit in a, a room and watch a TV and connect that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea. Of course, at the moment, we are not allowed to have more than four of us in the same. Yeah, time. right. <laughs> uh, and their activity yeah. director would probably be, we have a lot of responsibility for setting that up. And she doesn't work at night, but I'll yeah. think there are possibilities for the future. Yeah, for sure. We sh when, Once we all get vaccines, we should definitely look into that because uh, I, I have so many senior neighbors that walk in front of our house that always say hi and they're always, you know, always just friendly and I, I always mention this but they never they never come and i would love to see them uh make it easy for them to participate mm -hmm. that would be wonderful absolutely all right uh as uh, things are uh, we've been on this uh, uh discussion for a little while now so uh, we've had some discussion about forming subcommittees do we want to have any uh actions resulting from this? I think we probably do need to make official motion to form the subcommittees need, at least. That is, that is, yes, that is my way of, of suggesting okay. that if, if, if there's anything that we want to have as, a, as an official stance from the board where we get a, a vote, yeah, we'll need, we'll need motions and we'll have to jump through those. So uh, I, we, still have a, we, we still have our quorum, so we're, we're good. Um, okay. I can make a I can make a motion that as a board we are wanting to create three subcommittees for public art, sustainability, and events, um, with the goal of getting people on these subcommittees at our February meeting and launching them then. Second. Cool. Um, just a point of discussion on that. Do you want to uh, put any restrictions on the membership in these subcommittees? No. Other than no, not a quorum and open to community members. Okay, so we want to make sure that no matter at, at any meeting of these subcommittees, there is not a current quorum of board members in attendance. Mm -hmm. You yeah, just want to say no more than three mem three board three current board members. I would like to that... see us have more board members. So I want to leave this open if possible. Okay. That's a good point. I like your optimism, Tom. <laughs> I wonder, and this was kind of touched upon when we spoke about the theme of having these meetings mirror and be a better representation of our, of our larger community. Um, but I wonder if there's a way for us to, to, Increase the likelihood that that could be that that could happen. That our subcommittees could could better represent our community. I don't know how to do that, but well, I think I think I think on videos. next month is the initial period where we we form the the at least a couple base members, and those members can always invite more. You know, like as as the months go on. Um, and, and hopefully we get more people involved. So maybe that is, is just a goal for for our kind of baseline subcommittee members is to think about um, just a, a a diverse set of of folks in these subcommittees that are more representative of our, of our central Beaverton neighborhood. Yes, Amanda. Um, Miles, I don't know if this is possible, but is there any special messaging that we can do, like re, kind of like community outreach saying that the Central Beaverton NAC is recruiting subcommittee members for these three subcommittees so that people are like, oh, hey, that's me, and they'll show up and, and learn more? Um, 
you know, we could do something in the Year City magazine um, as a start. Um, we could also do it on the listserv, the email listserv. Mm -hmm. We could send out a special email. Um, put it social on media. Yep. Yeah, the Facebook. Um, I won't have time to do the Facebook. Somebody from your I team can, would have to do it. I um, do I've got editing on there, so. Yeah, we can definitely do that. I think it's especially if you have times and dates that you're meeting, and I can help you set up the Zoom meetings. Um, once you have those kind of details nailed down, then then it gives some somebody a way to show up that wants to. Um, yeah, there's different ways we could do it for sure. That's a good idea, Amanda. Can we advertise in more informal ways, like? next door or the Beaverton subreddit or like even a volunteer local volunteering website like through the BDA we use volunteermatch.com I don't know how narrowly we can target who sees it as in like just our city or anywhere um, or if there's another volunteering page like that where we can just post it somewhere randomly uh, next door is excellent. or excellent yeah um, the other thing about next door is, as the city, I can't see into it or really do anything with it besides publish to a, a pretty wide audience. But when well, you as residents can do more. Yeah, I think even as a, I think as a, you can post as like a general member. I don't know that you can post as like a board member because then you're just like, a, hey, this you can be more like, hey, the Central Beaverton Mac is doing this, not as posting as we, the Central Beaverton Mac, are doing this and i because i think that's where like the yeah i know that there was with facebook facebook yeah. is its own weird thing and there was some very special things that the, the city owns this Maybe facebook I'm... page and they get editor they get ownership of of the messaging from there so they're particular about well i it was it was related to me that that's how that uh uh uh, they they basically have veto power over things that are posted as uh, uh, on that. Um, I know. Maybe but, um maybe yeah. we can impose upon Amanda whenever you send out the minutes to the board or maybe the top uh, in the email to send a reminder for all of us to post on our next door personal pages uh, advertising for the meeting next month uh, specifically talking about the subcommittees. We'll be recruiting for the three subcommittees. We'd love to have you neighbor kind of thing um, show up at this meeting. Uh, and then let's see if we can juice up attendance for next month. And then maybe uh, maybe we can all put it on our personal Facebook page. I don't, I hate my Facebook page, but I'm sure someone I know lives in Beaver, Central Beaverton. Hold on a moment. Before we get too much farther, there is currently a motion uh that i believe uh, had been seconded is that correct uh, yeah i seconded is that, it is that after after discussion okay uh to form these yeah. three committees with the aforementioned restrictions on membership uh were there uh, is there anything else about this that we would like to codify in their instantiation uh maximum membership uh, frequency of meeting Great. Otherwise, these I are just not. these are just ad hoc committees with these purviews. Okay, fantastic. Because yeah, we can always change the rules, like once we know. Sure. Um, yeah. All right. So, all those in favor of uh, the motion on the floor to uh, form these three standing committees, say aye. 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 Unanimous. We're great. Now let's talk about filling them. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, so I was still planning, I hadn't done it yet. Uh, I was gonna do it around the first of the year, which it, there was a little tight between the first of the year and the first meeting, otherwise we made it. Um, uh, putting kind of a, this is what we did last year um, message on, on our Facebook page. Uh, and I even, now I've got the updated mask number, so that's even, even cooler. Um, so I'll include this uh, in process type message where we don't have anything set, but hopefully we'll get maybe a couple of tips of just people come to the general meeting next month and expressing interest. Um, and then uh, other than that, yeah, any one of us can hit the, the Beaverton Reddit or the uh, 
the next door page or multiple multiple vehicles can hit next door. Can I, can I make a request, Tom? Yeah. Um, on next month the agenda, could we have five minutes to brainstorm ideas on where to post? Because um, like Kevin just named rattled off a bunch. And I think if you guys thought about it for the month and brought a, a list that yep. you could email me, um, sure. that would be helpful. I can see what which what I have the, the capacity to tackle mm -hmm. and or what the city might be more effective at doing. So kind of a, a just a, a quick and dirty brainstorm. Social media corral. Okay. Great. I will include that. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll look. I'll, I'll just put an in-process message um, along with this paragraph or so that I've got to go up on the, the Facebook page um, uh, for the the official CBNAC. Anybody else who wants to broadcast to their their network can re should request through that um, uh, um I, I do have a piece of new business before you yes adjourn. i know uh okay. i recall um so with that that's board only or does it matter yeah. okay uh, yeah, other people can be there to listen but it's uh, oh, okay uh well before we adjourn right. then i will turn it over uh to you and then we'll go to comments and announcements um and then okay. we'll adjourn so um, I think you've probably all heard already about, you know, the downtown design, the new code that's come out, um, the idea for the, the loop, mm -hmm. the, the streetscaping and, and the yep. different projects they want to do. Um, they are looking for a member of the Central Beaverton NAC board to be on their community advisory committee. That was a request from, um, I think it's the, it's from the public, uh, the planning department. I believe mm -hmm. it's the engineering wing. Okay. Um, I think, unfortunately, Kevin with his other hat would be ineligible to participate on this one because he'd actually be hearing about it as a commissioner um, and ruling on it. So he's disqualified, um, but yeah, that they asked me. They asked me like ten minutes before the meeting if I can mention okay. that. So I'm sorry, I don't have more information about what it entails. Um, so I can provide a little bit more. Oh, okay. Not not much, like but a little bit. Basically, this Beaverton Loop project is the does streetscape design visioning for Watson and Hall between basically City Hall and oh. basically the library. Um, and looking at how it can be better you uh, better designed for different types of users, improve traffic flow, improve the safety of the area. And so the city's got the citizen advisory committee or community oh, advisory community. committee, whatever it's called. Yeah, thanks. Um, and they're looking for like downtown residents, local residents, business owners who can weigh in on it and provide some guidance. And I think it sounds really fascinating. And I think one of you, or if somebody is watching the recording of this later, could be really awesome and have a lot of fun with it. And they specifically want um, somebody to represent the kind of central Mac. viewpoint. Um, I don't know that it needs to be a board member, but that's who I would put it out to, to sure. start. Uh, and I don't know how you want to decide that, if you want to just look for volunteers or if you want to point um in the past and this is not the way you have to do things it's been the chair's discretion as kind of first dibs and they could pass on it if they wanted to and open it up to other people um by no means is that the way you have to run your meetings that's just one of the ways it's been done before when do they want somebody soon a name at least and i could get more details and email it to the group if that would be helpful like when they plan on meeting. Yeah, meetings and time commitment is the kind of question that I yeah. would have, and probably others here as well. If it's going to interfere with, you know, if it's their, if they're doing, if they're doing going during business hours, then some people may be precluded. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. My my schedule is fairly open, but has its own challenges. So. Yeah. Why don't I get more information from them? Um, the pertinent details. Email that out to the group. Um, and then 
work with Tom to figure out next steps. Sure. It could be sure. everybody emails Tom individually if they're interested or not, and Tom could talk with them. But you can't do it as a group unless it's on the agenda next month. Right. So what I was going to tell you is maybe to just take a quick moment and say uh, with that, I mean, we got a, um, I think most of the information here. Uh, accepting Kevin, Amanda, John, or Quinn is, or is, uh, is this sound uh, particularly interesting to any of you? Like, is anybody really champion? I would love to. I would definitely read more information about it. I've been to with John. We both went to one or two of the planning sessions with them where they reflect reflected the plans back where they were. And um, yeah, I would I would Miles. I would read uh, more info on what you provide. Okay. And if I can add, Rachel, I'm not volunteering you, but I am saying you've been to a couple consecutive meetings of ours and your interest in sustainability kind of overlaps with, with this sort of project, I think. So I would encourage you to look at it too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would also be interested in, in learning more if that is uh, an option for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Somebody can um, send me Rachel's email. I'll include her. John, if you can send me yeah, Rachel's we'll email. <laughs> yeah, we'll um, get it to you. And I'll just mention that it's not only, it's not all, it's not about cars. It's mostly about pedestrians and bicyclists and the mm -hmm. walking experience and the experience of being downtown. Um, and how do we move traffic through downtown as well, but how do we make it a walkable experience? Right. Uh, is the so uh, Kevin? You mentioned that the scope is currently stopping at about fifth. Do they have? Is there any plan to? I, I'm trying to remember what the map looked like from a couple of months ago when they brought it through. It's not going down past the the park to where they remerge. Right. Okay. Okay. And we know Kevin okay. will represent us pretty well too. Oh yeah, even though he can't he can't wear that hat, but he'll he'll be secretly wearing the TV Nat hat. It's good to have somebody on the inside. That's uh, right. Excellent. Uh, thank well, you. yeah. Th no, thank you, Miles. Uh, with that, um, are there any further comments, announcements, or concerns? Amanda. Um, I just wanted to share that thanks to all of your grant funding so that we were able to distribute the free art kits, we got rid of almost all of them. And it was pretty overwhelming um, handing them out to all of the families. They were all so excited and so grateful. And we made sure to tell them that it was funded by the Central Beaverton NAC. So hopefully it was a really good um, advertising <laughs> for, for the involvement and the effect that it can have on the community. Um, you guys funded 2,100 and we gave out uh, just over 2,000 of those. So we did have some left over. Um, so we got hit at the library with a really, really rainy day. And we're pretty sure that that, and that was our only weekend day that we were able to have distribution. So we're pretty sure that if we wouldn't have gotten hit with the bad weather that day, we would have gotten rid of all of the art kits. And then we also had over a thousand people attend virtual snow fest which we had 700 our first year in person last year. So we increased that number and so many of the families were participating together all across generations, all on one screen doing the activities. So it was a really rewarding experience and we're really grateful that you were part of making it happen. Amanda, um, when you fill out the reimbursement request for the grant or whoever is gonna do that, yeah. if you could maybe capture some of that excitement that you saw um, sure. that personal element and, and include that so I can share it with other NAC, other NACs about kind of what we've been discussing. How do you mm -hmm. get people excited? Sure. Yeah, of course, Melissa and I work together on those. So I'll make sure that we make sure to include like how excited the community was. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, to grow an event like that during a pandemic 
moving from in person to virtual is pretty incredible. Who knows? We were pretty excited because <laughs> we were kind of we didn't know because you can ask people to pre-register, but that doesn't mean that they will or that they'll show up because it's free and there's no money on the table when you right. sign up. So we were we were really really excited by the response and how many like you would have families that like sat up in front of their screen all day and went from one craft to the next to story time. And one of the librarians said it was like the biggest story time that she had ever had virtually. So she was pretty excited about that. So we're hoping that a lot of those families now are attending the virtual story times with the library so that we were really able to help our community partners that help support us as well. Well, I think I can say Come to us again next year with another funding request. We definitely will. Snowfest part three, it's going to happen. It's now Ooh. a thing that people are asking for. Nice. But we're, we're thinking about even if it's in person next year, how we still incorporate virtual opportunities because families that have small children, sure. like we're looking at how that becomes integrated. And so maybe part of Snowfest is virtual, part of Snowfest is in person or all of it's in person, but some of it's broadcast virtually. So as we're thinking about all of our programming for the theater, we're thinking about what moves to a virtual setting and what like our performances stay like in person, but how we can engage the community with supplementary material. Um, so yeah, we're thinking very strategically about that and anxiously, anxiously waiting until we can do another show. But until then we have workshops, so. Well, it's fantastic that you're able to continue the, the theater's work regardless. So, uh, I have a quick question for everyone. We got another shipment of, or shipment, another, uh, I, I got another 300 masks mm -hmm. to distribute this month. Uh, I'm going to reach out to my normal um, uh, circle, but I also wanted to, if you guys know of any groups specifically in the neighborhood or uh, organizations or people in general that might need masks. Um, Kevin, if you want any to the, the, the BDA or whatever, uh, I, I've got 300 um, that are uh, unclaimed. So if anyone needs that in the next week or so, reach out to me. Otherwise, I'll reach out to the normal circle and distribute them. Um, but kind of want to diversify that as well. Awesome. Uh, well, with that, if there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. Awesome. Wait, I have Happy one. New Year, guys. Can I ask one more thing? Oh. Sure. Go okay. for it. <laughs> um, the city gave out mail-in cards for people to give feedback on traffic coming on Main Street. And if we can talk next month maybe about reforming that process with another NAC as a partner or something. That would be good. Not now. Yeah, yeah I just want to comment on that really quick too. It, it went out twice, I think, oddly. Like there was That's a correct. second attempt thing, and I don't understand why that happened. But we, um, I talked to Mark Santuzzi at the budget committee. This is going to be his one of his top priorities this, this year to get this fixed. This has been for Miles Notes uh, all this gray hair you see, that's from traffic calming. I'm not getting old. It's traffic calming. But okay. it is, uh, it, it was brought up again, and, and he has bandwidth this year, and he's promised me that this will be a thing. So I would encourage you, if you have thoughts, to email Mark and Susie at his city email address, mm -hmm. um, especially on refining the whole process, because I think you will find a willing partner there who will, who will champion the neighborhood's views. Yeah, I've talked a lot about it already. 